get started this morning. For our call to worship, I'm going to read some from 1 John. And uh, it, it does go a lot along with what we talked about in, in class this morning about this manifestation. So, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare unto you the life, the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. We talked about this morning about Jesus and being that power that gives us the eternal life that we're looking forward to. And here John is saying uh, a lot of that, that we witnessed this. We, we saw him. We touched him. And he's bearing witness, but he's also telling us that the word of life is Jesus. The reason that we're able to live past this life is because of Jesus. Period. There is no other way. Us on our own, nothing. We are nothing. But because we have Jesus in our lives and He indwells in us, He gives us that power that we're looking forward to, to beyond this life. And so John is saying the same thing that Peter, when we talked about this morning from Peter, saying the same thing. Us alone, we're not going to get there. But with Jesus in our lives and being part of Him and being in Christ, that's where the power comes from. And able, enables us to get where we want to go, which is being with God and having that eternal life with Him. <clears throat> so this morning we're going to start, start our song service and talking, uh, of course, about Jesus and <coughs> knowing Him. <coughs> More about Jesus would I know, more of His grace to others show, more of His saving fullness see, more of His love who died for me. No 
still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you are with us today all the glory. And Father, we ask that your good will be done throughout this time in our lives and we do decide that we're going to follow Jesus who have you manifested for our salvation and our eternity. And Father, we thank you for the eternal life that you, you've established here on this earth for us to be able to have that eternal life and, and to, to, to understand how to, to be with you as our inheritance. We, we thank you so much for the way that you did that, and especially through your son Jesus who died on the cross. Father, so I pray in your son's name. Amen. 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 Our next song is I Am Thine. And just like that last song, we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. It's the same thing we're saying here. I am yours, is what we're saying to Jesus. And this will help us prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning. Taking that step, getting our minds right, getting our hearts in the right place, thinking about that decision we've made by saying that, I am thine. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it's all thy love to me, but I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to Thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer. Lord. 
still trying to work out what I'm going to say. <laughs> I do that. I was going to talk about angels, but now I'm not. Uh, I was really going to ask the question, why are we here today? And you might say, well, the pumpkin bread, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe that's causing some marital issues. <laughs> nutritional choices. Uh, Gracie last week had oatmeal cookies. I knew I shouldn't have had one because I'd have 12 more. <laughs> so, but that's not why we're here. Uh, in fact, um, I think really we could focus why we're here down to this right now. <clears throat> this is why we're here. And, and so why do we meet on this day? And why do we do this uh, today? And how often should we do it, what elements should we use, and all of that. And um, that's not really subjective. It, it isn't what we have decided to do. I think the Bible is very clear about many, many of those things. And so a lot of times we'll say, well, we do it so often. Maybe we shouldn't do it so often because then it would be more special. But um, God doesn't allow us to change his intentions in that regard just so that we and change the way we think about something. We need to get our heads together, and that's the, and that's the point of uh, having communion. Um, and Paul's gonna point that out in the scripture I'm gonna show you. So we look for different things in scripture to determine why we meet on the first day of the week, and that's today, that's Sunday. And uh, we readily will go to Acts 20, verse 7. It says, on the first day of the week, when they were gathered together, to break bread. Okay, Paul uh, began talking to them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged the message until midnight. Now, the message here is not to prolong the message to midnight. <laughs> the message is <laughs> that they gather together to break bread. Now, when they say break bread, we can mean several things by that. What is meant here in this instance is to break bread in the regards to the Lord's Supper. Which is not really a supper, it's more like the Lord's snack. Because it's not really a meal. Uh, the Corinthians were doing a meal. And uh, it's okay to do that, I really believe. It's okay to do that, but it uh, started losing its meaning with them. And they started uh, being selfish about things. And they weren't taking care of each other. And they weren't giving it the proper thought and reverence that it was. And Paul got on to them about that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so it meant on the first day of the week. Well, why that day exactly? What, what's going on with the first day of the week? Well, we can also see that over here in Luke 24, it says, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb. And guess what? On the first day of the week is when Jesus rose from the dead. And then we can also see in Acts chapter 2, uh, and we know that this is the, uh, the day of Pentecost, had come, they were all together in one place, and that's when the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles. And that was really the birthday of the church, if you think about it. And we don't really celebrate that day. The fit, it's the Pentecost. But Pentecost was on the first day of the week. It wasn't on Saturday or Friday or any other day. It was on the first day of the week. And that's when the Holy Spirit came. And then if we look over here in uh, Corinthians. Uh, wrong spot. I got more pieces of paper today than I should. Um, Concerning uh, the, uh, the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches in Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you put aside and save as he is prospered. Why on the first day of the week? Because they were already meeting on the first day of the week. And uh, if, if I were to, uh, you know, when, when it said they come to break bread together, that, quite honestly, is like saying, hey, you have a nice set of wheels, okay? <laughs> when you say that to someone that has a car, you mean the whole car, not just the wheels. And so when he says they came together to break bread, that means they came together to break bread and drink of the cup, okay? 
Okay. So let's get to the passage here in 1 Corinthians. Paul points out in chapter 11 that um, our Lord instituted this and it was on the Passover meal that he did it. The Passover was had been celebrated for hundreds and hundreds of years and we know that that was when the death angel passed over the houses of Israel. But guess what? It, the the um, member of the firstborn of Israel didn't die, but some had to die in order for that angel to pass over. And that was the lamb. The lamb had to die, and the blood was put on uh, the door. And so <clears throat> when Jesus comes along and institutes the, his supper, it is because he's doing it as the Passover was a shadow of something that was going to come. The Passover was less important than the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Christ became the Lamb so that death will pass over us. And so Paul's pointing that out. He said, this is my body. Do it for this reason. And the reason was to remember him. Uh, drink this cup. And the reason is to remember him. Okay? As often as you eat uh, this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So we're proclaiming something when we do this today. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Well, what is an unworthy manner? He's really speaking to what the Corinthians were doing. It's, it's you're not giving it the due that it is. You're not remembering it for what it should be. Uh, you should examine yourself, he says. Examine your life. Examine your attitude. Examine what you're doing when you, when you partake of this. If you eat and drink uh, this without doing that, you're bringing judgment on yourself. You're saying, Jesus is not really that important. I'm just doing this as a ritual, a tradition. It's something we do every week. Uh, is it really that important? And that's why I started off, that this is the reason we're here today. It's that important. We don't have to sing or say prayers or have cookies or have a lesson. We don't have to, have to do any of that. But we should be doing this. That's what's important. And so let me head back over here to Acts 2. Because sometimes people get confused about whether or not this is a meal or not. And, I, and I'll point out that after Acts 2.38, which said repent and be baptized, in verse 46 it says, And day by day they continued with one mind in the temple, and they were breaking bread from house to house, and they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. What they were doing there is not this. They were meeting day by day, sharing meals, and having fellowship with each other, breaking bread. And so there's a contrast there. There's a difference. So we can't use that scripture and say, we should be doing this every day. We should be doing it in our homes only. Uh, and we should be uh, have, making a meal out of it. We don't, it's, it's not really teaching us that. It's teaching what the Christians did to stay together. And so, uh, hopefully I wasn't too confusing with all of that, but we do this so often that it's important that we sort of uh, remember why we're here and what we're doing and what the point of all of this is. And so now, as, uh, as we bless uh, the emblems, then concentrate, get your attitude in your head where it should be. Think of Jesus and everything that he did and the suffering that he had <coughs> for the love that he had for us. If you would, bow with me. Thank you, Father, for this bread. We thank you, uh, Father, for the Son that you sent and died for us. It, uh, as he said, is his body, which is freely given, and we are to partake of this and remember Jesus as we do so. We need to remember him um, and make him a part of our life. Uh, let him dwell within us. And Father, we need to, um, as the scripture says, we need to add the things of you 
godly things uh, and be imitators of you in our lives by putting you, your spirit, and Christ in us each day. And we pray all of this in his name. said, um, plan your giving, um, and it should be generous, and it should be thoughtful. We should give because God gave, and um, we collect money to help the saints, and we, we collect money to help uh, spread the word collect money so that we can help others and provide things for people that need help so that's why we do it and we should do it and collectively we can uh, do more than individually if you would pray with me thank you father for the blessings that you've given us which are many what a blessed place a blessed nation we are a people that is blessed, blessed by you, and we pray, Father, that we would bless others in return, and that we would show you that uh, we surrender our lives, and our commitment is to you in all things, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Ryan gives us our lesson, we're going to sing, "Tis is so sweet to trust in Jesus. But before the lesson, we're going to sing, Walking in Sunlight. Um, just as we partake, just partake of the Lord's Supper, we have decided to do that ourselves. We have given Him our lives. And just like this song says, we have decided to walk in the light ourselves. We don't live in the darkness of the world anymore. We have stepped out of that because Jesus now reigns. So when we sing this song, sometimes think about the words that we're singing. The words that we're singing here is, now I'm walking in sunlight. I don't have to worry about the darkness of the world anymore because Jesus lives in me and he shines a light for me. So sometimes we, we sing these songs and we've, we've memorized them. A lot of the songs I don't have to look at because we can sing them, right? Because we've heard them so many times. But a lot of times we don't think about what the words really say to us, what they mean to us. And so, this is a deciding. I've decided to do this. And so, think about when we sing these songs. <laughs> Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said pretend like they were part of a wedding just so they could join in the party and, you know, get the free booze and stuff like that. And, and, and we, we have other examples, you know, people, people who sometimes 
uh, go to a, a place where they have a variety of uh, a fair, uh, things like a, a bar mitzvah or different things like that, and they'll just go in and try to sort of be part of the crowd just to get some free stuff or whatever. And, and so this notion of party crashing is just something that's not a new idea, but it's an idea that, that does play into our society a lot. And, and it's kind of an idea that Jesus explores over in Matthew chapter 20 when he tells a parable about another landowner. A lot of his parables involve farming because that's what most of the people he's talking to are familiar with. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. So in our terminology, this would be at about 6 o'clock in the morning, basically just as the sun's coming up, which is the perfect time to go out and hire people because what happens is you get some people who have jobs. But a lot of people, because farming is seasonal, don't really have a full-time job. So as you need workers, you can go and hire them in the marketplace, and, you know, in the community center kind of a thing. Today, if you need somebody to, well, maybe not so much up here, but down in the valley, if you need somebody to help you with a construction project, you go to Home Depot. You can find some people there looking for work. Um, this is what's going on. And the people who he's talking this to, 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 telling this to, totally understand this, because this is their world and the kind of thing that they sometimes do. And the denarius is a day's wages. It's almost the definition of the day's wages, of how much you should pay people for working for a full day. So he's hired them at 6, and he expects them to work until 6 p.m., a 12-hour day, which is, you know, today we would think that was outrageous, but at the time that was pretty normal. So far, we're, he's telling them a story, and they're like, yeah, we get this. All right, cool. So it says then at about the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. So he gets some more. Now, this is 9 o'clock. And again, the people listening are still understanding. These guys, maybe they got there a little late. Maybe they had something going on. Whatever it was, they're there. They're looking for work. He sends them in. But now he has said, Jesus has deliberately introduced an element of ambiguity into this. Because you notice, like, exactly, Tim's over there mouthing the words. He knows. He, instead of saying a denarius, he says whatever is right. Now, see, that's really interesting because the people that he's telling the story to are thinking, okay, the Denarius minus three hours' work is, they're doing the math. Maybe they're not real good at it, but they're doing the math. So he went out again about the sixth hour. So now this is about noon that he goes out again. And, he, and about the ninth hour, he does the same thing. And now the people are like, number one, how many people is this guy in his vineyard? And number two, what does it mean to pay them what's right? I mean, the, 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 guy, the, the guys that come at the sixth hour, that's noon, they're half wages. The guys at the ninth hour, they're getting a quarter of a Denarius. I mean, I guess they're getting something for their work, but, you know, it seems kind of ridiculous. This guy keeps going out and getting more people. And, and whatever is right, he keeps getting this smaller and smaller and smaller. And then he gets really outrageous, because Jesus says, about the 11th hour, this would be 5 o'clock p.m., he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answer. He said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. So these guys, they're just there for one hour. That's all the, the time that's left before dark, and you don't work after dark in a place that doesn't have electric, electrical lights. So they know they're going to work for an hour, and they're probably expecting, the people in the crowd are certainly expecting them to pay, get paid less to, uh, next to nothing because they hardly worked any time at all. So then it says, when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and begin to pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. Now, <laughs> This is one of those things where, because this is a story that was made up, this interaction didn't happen. But in real life, I would wonder at like what point he had to explain to the foreman what his plan was, and the foreman's going, "Yeah, that's not how. <laughs> Maybe you're new to this landowning thing, but that's actually not how this works, you know." But but in the story, we don't have that conversation. So the workers get called, and Jesus says, "The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour, one hour left, one hour of work came, and each received the denarius." That means they basically received 12 times as much pay for their work as they would have expected to get. They would have been really excited about this. This is fantastic. We got a denarius. This guy must be drunk or something. You know, he gives, we got a denarius for an hour's work. You know, this is really awesome. But then it turns around and we start to see it from the perspective of the people on the other side because he's put them in reverse order. So they see the ones who work for one hour and then the ones who work for three hours and the ones who work for six hours. And they keep just getting a denarius. And so on the one hand, it says, Jesus says, when those, when, so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. What's interesting is, by that time, they had seen every other worker get a denarius. So why did they expect to receive more? Have you ever thought about that? Wouldn't they have already, I mean, by now, most people would be able to figure out the trend, you'd think, right? But they still expected to receive more. 
but each of them also received the denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Now, they're not grumbling because he didn't pay them what he promised them. They're not grumbling because it's not fair, because it is a day's wages. They're grumbling, it says, because these who were hired last worked only one hour. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. This isn't fair. You, you, you're paying people who worked so much less than us, one twelfth of the work that we did, in the evening when it's nice and cool and it's pleasant and everything, you're paying them just as much as you paid us. That's not fair. You should have paid us more, or you know, you should have paid them less, but either way, you should, something is wrong here. And the owner says, I am not being unfair with you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? And then this is the really damning phrase. Or are you envious because I am generous? <laughs> I'm not being mean to you. I did exactly what I promised you would do. This is completely fair. I did everything I said I would do. You did your work. You did a great job. I paid you. Totally fair. You're mad because I'm being too nice to other people. And on a fundamental level, there's something wrong with that. But on another fundamental level, that is absolutely how human beings regard reality. And we're going to talk today about the disconnect between our reality and God's reality when it comes to fairness. Because Jesus says, and this doesn't seem fair to anybody, so the last will be first and the first will be last. There are a lot of theological questions in the Bible that are challenging. A lot of ones that, that I find difficult to figure out exactly what they mean. This is like near the top of a list. What does he mean when he says the last will be I can't even write the page down here. There we go. What does he mean when he says the last will be first and the first will be last? Does he mean that literally some will be that you're going to be rewarded more because you were the last one into the game and that you're going to be rewarded less because of that? Does it mean you're going to get your reward later? What is what does he mean by this? What is he trying to say? And I think I'm going to start off by telling you sort of the secret to this, and then, that, and then we'll talk and unpack it as we go along. The, the point is that the issue isn't who got there first. The issue is the decision to get there, the decision to be part of the kingdom. That's what matters. It doesn't matter when it happened. It matters that it happened. And so thinking in terms of being first, being there longer, is an incorrect way to think about the kingdom because that's not how the kingdom works. It's not that some people are going to get rewarded more and some people are going to get rewarded less, because that's exactly not what Jesus just said. It's that everybody's going to get rewarded the same and focusing on why somebody else got the same thing you did because they didn't try as hard or do as much is the wrong way to think. But this is really hard for us. This is contrary to the way that we think as people. Sort of. So we're going to take a look at three principles of the vineyard when it comes to how we view salvation and the gospel and the kingdom and how we view our fellow members of the kingdom. And the first one is that we have to be able to distinguish between two important concepts, and that is the difference between something that's earned and something that's given. We think in terms of what we have earned most of the time. We rarely think in terms of what we've been given. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God explains to the Israelites why he chose them. And what's interesting, he does this, in this particular context, he doesn't spend any time talking about his relationship with Abraham because what he's going to say is actually something that's older than Abraham. What he's going to say is something that, it, that, is, that is the reason why he chose Abraham himself. And the reason isn't because of how faithful Abraham was or how Abraham said yes because Abraham hadn't said yes to him. The reason is something that's a little bit surprising. He says to them, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Now this is a, I mean, wow! We have been chosen of all the peoples of the earth to be God's treasured possession. This is a quick way to get a big head. You know, God must love that. We must be better for something, right? I mean, we must be smarter, or there's more of us, or we're stronger, or something, because God picked us. We must be great because God picked us. And, and what they mean by that is God must have picked us because we were great. And here's what God says. You got it backwards. He says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. I picked one dude, Abraham, and I turned him into a nation. The guy who was 100 years old before he ever had a kid, this is the guy who turned into a nation. Obviously, that's about as fewest as you can get right there. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of the king of Egypt. Notice what he's saying there. He says, you're right. 
when you think, you must be great because I chose you, but you've got it backwards. You think I chose you because you're great. I'm telling you, you're great because I chose you, and I made you great. And it's, it's two different ways of thinking about the exact same sentence, but it's the difference between earned and given. I earned God's favor because I'm so great. I was given God's favor, and now I'm great. Two totally different concepts. And in Galatians, Paul says to the Galatians, you are having the exact same problem. You think this is about earned, and the truth is that it's about given. He says, you foolish Galatians, this is when they have started to live, listen to these Judaizing teachers. They're trying to act like Jews and follow all the rules of the Jews so that they can really be saved. And he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law? or by believing what you heard. Are you so foolish? He says, where did you get your truth from? Did you get it because you were so good at obeying the law? You bunch of Gentiles who've never obeyed a law in your life? Is that why you were chosen? Is that why you were saved? Or were you saved because you believed? Did you earn it, or were you given? And he says, are you, after beginning with the Spirit, you, you, you know it was given to you, you know it was, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? It was given to you. Why are you trying to earn something that's been given to you already? You know? It's, it, it's, it's the, the, the classic, you know, trope of beating a dead horse. I mean, you really, you, you've got everything you need. Are you trying to attain it by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. God at one point says to Abraham, I am the Lord your God, walk before me and be blameless. I don't think what he's saying to him is, I want you now to go be the perfect guy and never make any mistakes. I think what he's saying to him is, if you walk before me, I'm going to make you blameless. Just like with the Galatians, Paul is saying to them, you're, God put you before him and he made you blameless because of his power. Now don't turn that into trying to walk some specific way and follow a bunch of rules that men have made up and men are trying to impose on you simply so that you can somehow achieve what God has already given you. That's impossible and it's wasteful because it's already been given to you. So when we think about salvation, when we think about the kingdom, the kingdom is something that we are given, not something that we have heard. And when you understand that it's something that's given to you, it changes your relationship with the kingdom. Because if your employer doesn't pay you wages after you do your work, what do you think to yourself? This isn't fair. This isn't right. I'm going to take this guy to court. I'm going to let you know let the uh, whatever uh, equal employment opportunity commission or whoever it is. I'm going to let them know this guy's cheating me of something that I deserve. Because you do. If you have a contract for employment and you're supposed to get paid a certain wage and you don't get paid that wage, that is a violation of the contract. It's not right. But if you don't have a contract. And you can't ever earn the thing that you need. And somebody just says, I'm going to give you this. You don't have the ability to take them to court and sue them if they don't give it to you. Or if you don't like the gift that you got given or something. It's a gift. And so there's a big difference between how we interact with the kingdom. If we think it belongs to us by right versus that it belongs to us by gift. And that also changes how we think about the people in the kingdom. Which brings us to our second point, our second principle. How do we view the gift that we've been given? What are we going to do with the gift that we've been given? Are we going to use the kingdom as a force for unity or a force for deconstruction? To tear down or to build up and join together? In the Galatians, again, because this is the issue he's dealing with, Paul talks about a story, something that had happened that the Galatians themselves would have known about, an interaction that he had with Peter when Peter came to visit the Galatian church after Paul had been there for some time teaching them. And in Galatians, he says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group, the group that we have called the Judaizers, those who are trying to make people follow the tenets of Judaism, even as they are Christians, on the grounds that that is necessary for you to be a good Christian, because that's what the rules were for the Jews before Christianity ever came into existence. So he says, when Peter first came, he joined us, he was eating with the Gentiles, everything was fine. And Peter, of all the apostles, the original 12 apostles for sure, should have understood the Gentiles were just like the Jews, because he was the one who had been sent to the first Gentile convert, the Cornelius. 
he was the one who had been given the vision of all these different animals that could be killed and eaten to, to make him understand that there was no distinction. He even says, I now understand that there's no distinction. And so that's what he's doing until certain people come from James who are of that circumcision from certain Judaizers. And suddenly Peter, who's a good Jew most of the time, remembers he's not acting like a good Jew anymore. He's got to go back to be a good Jew. So he starts hanging out with them and now with the other ones. And now we have unity having disintegrated into deconstruction. Peter was unified with them at first, and now he has become separated from them, and he separated himself out from them. And there's a form of judgment that's coming along with this. I'm not going to eat with them anymore because that's not the way you're supposed to do it. That's not the people you're supposed to eat with because these people who know what the rules are, they're here now. He says, the other, Paul says, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all of them, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Why are you making them different from you when you know and you live in a way that says they're not? Why do you live like them one time and then change what you're doing and make it seem like there's something wrong with that when it's embarrassing or when the wrong group of people are there watching you? We who are Jews, he said to Peter, by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. He says, you know the unifying principle. The unifying principle is faith, and that faith overcomes law just like it overcomes sin, and it brings all of us into the same kingdom. You know that. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Why are you creating disunity? Why are you creating rules that people have to follow when those rules don't apply anymore? Why are you forgive, forgetting the gift and trying to make people earn what they're supposed to do? Are you so envious of God's generosity that you would do that? That's what he's really asking him. Unity is our birthright as Christians. Unity is baked into the, the nature of what Christianity is. It's designed into it because of the idea that the grace of God covers over all of it. Jews, Gentiles, whatever you've done, however bad it is, however not so bad it is, it's covering over all of it. And because of that, we are all clean the same. We have the same spirit indwelling us, so unity should be coming about. But our envy of God's favor and generosity gets the best of us way too often, and deconstruction comes about. And then finally, application number two is the, the, the difference between judgment and compassion. Understanding where judgment applies and where compassion applies. And how we deal with party crashers is supposed to come out of a place of compassion, but the truth is, most of the time, it comes out of a place of judgment. We find ourselves in an odd place because we are God's messengers, ambassadors to the world, telling the world about Jesus Christ and his salvation. And yet, when somebody takes that salvation on, we're like, well, okay, yeah, but you're not really good enough yet. <laughs> you're not enough like us yet. You don't live in a nice middle-class neighborhood with the kind of friends that we want you to have, and you say some things we don't like you to say. And you, you know, you, you do some things that we don't feel comfortable with, and you don't dress right for church. That's the biggest clue. If you don't dress right for church, we know that I'm supposed to be there. You know? So so we 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 we, get, we we build these judgments and we use them. And and we are God's ambassadors. We're the ones out there saying, you know, come in, and then they get here and we're like, oh, not you, okay, you know. And it's funny because when you look in the Old Testament, we, we serve a role that's very similar to the prophets in the Old Testament. They were God's ambassadors. In many cases, in most cases, they were the ambassadors to the Jews themselves, to, the, to the Israel, to, to Judah. But in one particular case, the only actual Old Testament prophet to be truly successful, he was sent to a completely different nation. Jonah was called by God, and God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell them all the sins they're, they're, uh, they're committing, and that they're about to be destroyed if they don't repent. And Jonah says, I don't think so. And he jumps on a boat and heads the other way. Now, we know the whole story. You know, the, the, the storm comes up. They throw him overboard. He gets swallowed by a whale or a fish of some sort. Um, by the way, I don't know if it was a whale or not. People say, but whales aren't fish. And I'm sure that's really important to us who know the difference between whales and fish. I'm confident that the people back there did not know the difference. So what it was, we don't know. He was swallowed by it. And then spits him up three days later after he's had some time to contemplate on his poor choices. Presumably near the shores of Nineveh, just to make the point that God's really messing around with him. 
And so then he's like, okay, I'm going to Nineveh. So he goes and preaches, goes to the city three days, and, and the, the city converts. The king puts on sackcloth and ashes and orders everybody to repent. The whole city repents, and God forgives the whole city, which makes Jonah, I'm not kidding you, the most successful prophet of the entire Old Testament. No other prophet was listened to by the, by the Jews. They were, they were stoned and beaten and thrown into wells. And at one point, Jeremiah sends a scroll to the king. And as the guy who's reading in the scroll reads it, he cuts off the parts that he's just read and throws them in the fire to, to show just how little he cares about the word of God. No other prophet was successful. Jonah is the only prophet ever to be successful. And what is his reaction? Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Isaiah's going, what? I would, have given, I would have given my leg for that kind of response. And you're angry? But he prayed, he prayed to the Lord, oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? The reason I didn't want to go is because I, I knew this was going to happen. I knew, and I was quick to flee to Tarshish because I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And I don't like it. You know, I, I know who has ever read that passage out loud like that and ended with, and I don't like it. But that's what Jonah is saying. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God. What kind of a God are you? You're gracious and compassionate. This is totally unreasonable. That's what he's mad about. God is gracious and compassionate. And so he says, I'm so fed up with this, I just want to die. Now, Lord, take away my life for it's better for me to die than to live. Again, Isaiah's going, what is wrong with you, dude? You, you were successful. You got them to listen to you. And you want to die because you actually got it. You did your job? I mean, this is nuts. It is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? That's kind of a good question. And Jonah, Jonah doesn't even answer him. Jonah's just so mad. He storms off and off. Actually, th this has happened before this. He's already gone out and sat down in the place east of the city because it says there he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what happened to the city. So this is probably kind of stepping back and saying this conversation took last place after he'd gone out and watched this. The city wasn't destroyed. Can you imagine Jonah sitting there? It's three days and then it's going to be destroyed. He goes out and sits out there. He's like, all right, I'm ready for the ship. You know, let's, let's, let's bring on the fire and brimstone, God. We're going to see another Sodom and Gomorrah here, you know. And the time ticks by, and nothing happens, and he's like, dang it, I thought there, were, there was going to be you know, some destruction, some calamity, and instead, they have been, God has been compassionate, and now he's mad, and this is where he's having this anger, this, this argument with God. So he's sitting out there, waiting, and nothing happens, and he's mad at God, and it says, the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the vine. So God provides him, gives him a vine to help to shade him while he's sitting out there watching the city not be destroyed and fuming over how angry he is. Mm -hmm. But at dawn the next day, God provided, that's an odd word for this, provided a worm. Anybody ever thought, boy, I'm glad God provided me worms in this, you know? <laughs> provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. So he provided him a worm. And then when the sun rose, God provided a scorching, here you go, I've got something for you, a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. So it's interesting that each time here the, the word provided is used, and it's not an accident, it's a very deliberate choice of word. God gave this to Jonah for a reason. Each of these things. He provided the vine for a reason, he provided the worm for a reason, he provided this hot wind for a reason. All of it is so that Jonah can learn something. Because Jonah's back to the same place he was before. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. So he's not happy when the city isn't destroyed. He's not happy when the vine is destroyed. There's, there's, a, 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 there's a, a guy, uh, I forget his name, was um, Mark Twain, talking about a, a socialite woman that he knew who said, you know her, she's not happy unless she's not happy. I think Jonah might be that kind of a guy. He's not happy unless he's not happy. So he's not happy, he's angry, he wants to die, and God says, do you have any right to be angry about the vine? And Jonah said, I do, I am angry enough to die. You know, you better be careful about saying how ready you are to die in front of the creator of heaven and earth, because sooner or later, he might take you up on it, you know? But fortunately, God's not done teaching Jonah lessons. And so the Lord said to Jonah, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. You have nothing to do with it. You didn't earn it. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Remember when Jesus said that, the, 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 that God is concerned about even the, the birds? 
He is. I mean, literally, right there he says it. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Or are you envious that I am generous? Are you envious that I am generous? Shouldn't I be concerned? I gave you the vine, and I took it away, and you treated it like it was something you earned, and something that was precious to you, and something you deserved. I created this city. You didn't create this city. I gave the life to those people that are in this city. Don't I get to decide what happens to it? Don't I get to be concerned about what happened to it when I created it, when I earned it? You didn't even do anything to make that vine, and you're concerned about it. Change the way that you think, Jonah. Change the way that you think and recognize that my generosity towards you with the vine is a tiny fraction of my generosity and my compassion towards the city. So we have to understand, we have to recognize not only that we have been given the kingdom, not that we've earned it, but also that once we have the kingdom, that we are about unity in the kingdom, not about deconstruction and finding differences. And finally, we have to understand that we are not simply about doing things because they belong to us, and we have the right to issue judgments about them and decide who should give them, but we are about compassion because as God's ambassadors, that's what we've been called to do. Our job is to go and tell the world so they will become part of the kingdom, not to tell the world so they can become part of the kingdom and we can judge them and tell them how bad they are. That's not our job. God will convict them of what they need to be convicted of. They are his servant, and that's, you know, that's the process. So I know some of you are sitting there thinking, did he forget that last week he told us that there was going to be a second part to the sermon? We're going to talk about the other son, and no. If you haven't figured it out by now, this leads us right into the part about the other son from last week. The guy who comes home after the party to find his brother being, uh, well, after, comes home during the party to find his brother having returned, and he's not happy about it. <laughs> Luke says that, that there's the party going on, they've, they've killed the fatted calf, there's, they're, 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 he's been you know, dressed in a robe, rings on his finger, he's back to being the son. And meanwhile, he says the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, and that wasn't on the schedule, presumably, because that's not the thing, sort of thing you do every day. So he called out to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because of the cows him back safe and sound. Now, I'm guessing that if he hadn't come back to the celebration, he'd just come back and gone inside and seen the younger brother sitting disheveled at the, at the, you know, the kitchen table with a you know, cup of coffee, talking about how bad things were, he might not have had a problem with that. Because, you know, that's okay. But when he comes home and we're having a party for the son, that's a problem. And so it says the older brother became angry, refused to go in. So his father went on and pleaded with him, and he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. I've earned this. I've earned the right to be your son and to have these things. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice the phrasing, not my brother, when this son of yours, there's that disunifying function. That deconstruction, he's not part of our family anymore. This son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, and there's the judgment part. We had to get all three of them. It wasn't hard. <laughs> has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home. You killed the fed of calf for him. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I have worked for you my entire life, and you've never even given me a goat to do to celebrate with my friends. I wonder if you ever thought to ask. But you've never even done that for me. This guy comes home after ruining us nearly, after ruining his own life, and he comes home, and you're having a party for him. And the father responds, and he answers all three of the things. He says, my son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. It's been given to me. It's on earth, it's given. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. We are unified. We are one family. He was lost and is found. We had to celebrate, because there's unity in family. And there's compassion that comes out of that. That's why there's a celebration. That's why he's being accepted home. Not because he's better than you. Not because he did everything right. The party is not about him. The party is about us. That we are restored as a family. That we have had a salvation take place. We're not celebrating the things that he did wrong. We're celebrating the fact that he came back home again. We're celebrating the fact that the kingdom has grown again. <coughs> We struggle with this concept all the time. I can remember a long time ago when I was in college, actually I was at law school at the University of Arizona, 
And uh, my, the, the home church, my home church at Mesa, every two or three years we have this guy come and speak to us. His name is F. Lagarde Smith. He's a Christian writer. He's written a number of different books. Most of his books are not fictional. They are explorations of theological topics. A lot of times they are focused around um, things that are of particular interest during that time period. Like he wrote one about the New Age movement, when the New Age movement was particularly strong. Um, different things like that. Well, he was coming because he actually, one book that he had written, and he'd written a book that was kind of looking at some sort of guesswork about what Jesus' childhood might have been like prior to his beginning of his ministry, because we don't know that much about it from the scriptures. We know more than we, we sometimes think we do, if you go through and really read it. We don't know a lot. So he was kind of going through and asking, kind of asking and sort of trying to explore the questions of things like, when did Jesus realize that he was the Messiah? When did Jesus realize he was the Son of God? When, you know, I'm guessing like at two years old he didn't know he was the Messiah. That'd be a little bit much for a two-year-old, you know? <laughs> so kind of looking through some of those things, he wrote this book. But a number of people in the, in, the, in the church knew that he was in the process of submitting and finalizing another book about the afterlife. And in particular, that in that book about the afterlife, that he took the position that hell was not necessarily an eternal punishment and suffering, but rather a destruction of the soul that was a permanent eternal event. And so a number of the people were concerned. They disagreed with this philosophy, this idea that the Lugard Smith had come up with. And so when I got home, he, he, it was his, his habit of doing a, uh, doing a little talking for a little while and then going and they would have a kind of a question and answer period. And apparently early on in the question and answer period, the people who were upset with this idea about the way the afterlife should look had begun to sort of Shanghai the conversations. They weren't talking about the, the book he was there for. They were talking about this other thing. And so I walked into Mesa's Fellowship Hall as they were, as you've got Regard Smith on one side and you've got everybody else on the other side. If you want a more graphic sense of disunity, you will never see a visual image more like that. And, and everyone there is upset because he's saying this thing that is challenging them and that threatens the way that they think that eternity should look. And as I got there and began to, to see what was going on, the lawyer in me, who enjoys a good argument anyway, <laughs> decided to join in on his side. Because I liked what he was saying. I tended to agree with some of his logic. But more to the point, I just liked to argue. And there was a lot more people to argue with on that side. Than, and he's a lawyer. I don't want to argue with a lawyer. I'm not stupid. I know better than that. And so <laughs> having had experience with it after all. So, so but, but what happened after I've been there for about 10 or 15 minutes, and one particular lady who was a really nice, nice lady, she was generous and she was kind and she was thoughtful and she did lots of things for people she said something that has stuck with me for all of these years and she said it's just not fair that they don't have to suffer when i have gone through so many things in this life oh, wow. all those sinners don't have to suffer for eternity when i've gone through and i didn't answer i couldn't i could not i could think of a lot of answers I couldn't think of any of them did begin with you more on it, so I definitely didn't think that was a good way to begin. But I also didn't think, it was one of those things where somebody says something that's so stunning, so wrong, that you, you almost, it almost takes your breath away. You know, to think that the reason why so many of these people are having a problem with this isn't because they disagree with the philosophical underpinnings of what he's saying, and most of the argument was not about that. It was a disagreement with the idea of the fairness of it. That somehow, if I was getting an eternal reward, the reciprocal of that has to be that they're going to get eternal punishment. That there's nothing in between. And I'm not here to try to litigate or argue this particular position. My point is the mindset behind it. I'm not upset that, that people might not, be, might not go to hell and suffer for eternity because I don't think that's what the scriptures say. I'm so upset because I don't think that's fair. And if there's one thing that gets in the way of our ability to be accepting, to withhold our judgment, to let people into the kingdom and treat them like they are full-blooded members of the kingdom, it is our concept of fairness. Mm -hmm. Fairness gets in our way over and over and over again because we think it's not fair. I have spent my life working for God. I have done all the right things and made all the choices and chosen not to do all these fun things that I could otherwise do, and I've sacrificed and I've lived this miserable existence as a Christian all this time. You see where the thinking started to generate on you there? But that's exactly what that lady was saying. I have suffered all these things. It's not fair that they don't have to suffer now. Instead of stopping and thinking about, you know, what, what the, 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 the father says to the son, you are mine. Everything I have is yours. You're always here with me. This is good, not bad. Right. We work because God wants us to work because we have a job to do. We don't work because God wants to make us miserable. 
We don't make good choices because God wants to make us miss out on the good things. We make good choices. It's really only people who can because the Spirit in us helps us to do that. Everything we have from God is a blessing. Even the things that sometimes the provisions of the worm and the wind that don't seem like such great things, they are blessings too. And when we start thinking in terms of, you don't, shouldn't get as much as me because I haven't had it as good as you, we have completely misunderstood the gospel on a fundamental level. And we are completely misapplying the gospel to the people who have come to join us. And when we do that, we step right into the role of a group of people that Jesus had very little good to say about, and that's the Pharisees. Because in Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. You Pharisees, you know the law. You sit in the seat of Moses, and for good reason, because you do know the law. And you are teachers, and you have studied, and you are, you are doing what you, know, what you would claim to be as best. And you, at least we talked in the class, they started off with noble motives, even if that's not where they ended. You have all of this, and yet, instead of welcoming people in to the kingdom and showing them how to get closer to God, you try to keep them out and keep them less and make them in fear. And you're so busy keeping them out of the kingdom that you're on the wrong side of the gate, too. You know? The best defense is in football, push the other team back. Well, if you push the other people back far enough, you're going to be out of the end zone yourself, and you're going to miss out, too. It turns into a game of it's us and you. And you aren't good enough for us. You are different than us. You come from a bad background. And you don't look like us. And you don't dress like us. And you don't sound like us. You don't belong here with us. Because it's my kingdom. It's my mind. It's my city. And God says, are you so envious of my generosity? Are you so envious? Paul says you've got to reverse your thinking. In Romans, he says, you see at just the right time when you're still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not earned. You were still sinners when Christ died for you. You were still powerless when Christ died for you. You weren't a good person for whom some anybody might possibly dare to die. You were a sinner, and Christ still came, and he still died for you because God loved you. You were saved as a gift, not because you were, not because you deserved it. He goes on elsewhere. Actually, he said this earlier, but in my point, he goes on. Now a righteousness from God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes from faith, sorry, through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. See, there's not better or worse. There's not the first one here and the last one here. There's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we need to understand two things that aren't different. We aren't different from where we start and we aren't different from where we end. We were all sinners, we all fell short of the glory of God, and we were all justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We don't need gatekeepers to keep people out because no gatekeeper has the right to keep anybody out. The people who are trying to come in aren't any different than the people that are on the inside already. They've gone through the same stuff, they've made the same choice, and they are accessing the same grace through faith that all the rest of us have. And so unity is the name of the gate. We are all the same. Of course we should be unified. We all come from the same stock of sinful humans, created by God for something better, and we have all been transformed into the likeness of His Son through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we've become the same. So unity is the name of the game. And then finally, we're going to finish with this. Compassion is what comes out of that. We see it in God's compassion, and it turns into our compassion. Because Paul says, as for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. We're dead. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. We have become, elsewhere Paul will say, the righteousness of God. Think about that. We want to earn God's favor. We want to disunify for the sake of being the best Christians, not the less qualified Christians. We want to judge, 
to show that we are better because it's a form of judgment. It's, it's about fairness, but it's not real fairness because if it was really fairness, we'd all be in trouble. It's comparative fairness. I'm better than you are, so I'm good and you're not good enough. We don't want to compare ourselves to the actual standard, which is Jesus, because we all fall short of that. We want to compare ourselves to the guy who's just a little not quite as good as us. And then we're better, and we're okay, and we don't want them in because they're different than us. But God says, Paul says, you are all dead. You are all made alive. And elsewhere he says, you become the righteousness of God. We, we're not earning. We weren't chosen because of how good we are. We weren't good at all. But we've been chosen. We've been given. Because of this, we are infinitely precious to God. And we have been made infinitely precious within this world. Lights that shine in the world, if only we will be admitting people into the kingdom and stop standing in their way. This is a hard message for all of us because our instinct is tribal. I'm different than you, I'm better than you because of it. Every single human being is, I think, born with that instinct. If not, they're trained into it real early on. But God is not a tribal God. God is a God of everybody. And God loves everybody and He wants everybody to be in His kingdom if we'll just get out of the way. If we'll just stop being envious of His generosity. Let's stand and say it. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word just to rest upon His promise, just to know the same the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how Oh, for grace to try.